Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Justin Carter. I'm a project associate with the Center for Rural Affairs. I'd like to welcome you all to another session of Models of Native Cooperative Ownership. Today, we're blessed to be joined by Arts Cooperative. We have Candice and Elroy with us to present today. And uh, we also have Pamela Standing with us again to facilitate. So thank you all for being here. If you're not too familiar with the Center for Rural Affairs, we're a small nonprofit. We're located in Lyons, Nebraska. We do a variety of things with small towns. We have a small business and a micro lending arm for rural Main Street small businesses. We have an inclusion arm that works with new immigrant communities in Nebraska. We have a policy team that advocates for rural policy at the state and federal level. And then we have our farming community team that does a lot of grassroots agriculture and food systems work. And on that team, we have staff members uh, who uh, live and work in the uh, Santee Sioux and Omaha Nation communities in Nebraska. So with that, uh, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you all again. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Pamela. Well, and we just want to welcome Elroy and Candace. And uh, we want to uh, we're really excited about this because this will be the first time, it's been kind of a dream of mine, that we can have all of these beautiful recordings from our tribal communities and our, our native led cooperatives in real time. And so we'll have a reference to go back to because there's some amazing work that's happening around the country. And arts is another example of that work. And we wanna welcome Elroy and Candace. And uh, can't, they're both artists. Candace is uh, an amazing artist, but she also is working in cooperative development. And uh, we work together on another project, uh, a, a national project with Trista, who's on the call from Saskatchewan. And uh, we're, I'm really excited uh, that we're doing this work together about our native cooperatives uh, and First Peoples cooperatives up in Canada. So we want to welcome them and we want to thank people for joining us tonight. Yeah, you want to go first? Okay, sure. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. So hello, my name is Candace Kwong. I'm the secretary for the Board of um, Arts or Ancestral Rich Treasures of Zuni. I also have the great fortune to be a cooperative developer and marketing, marketing and research specialist. Sorry, my title just changed. So I have to think about that. <laughs> For the Co-op Catalyst of New Mexico. Nice to meet you all. And good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aure Narichu Jr. <clears throat> I am the site coordinator for the Arts Cooperative as well as a board member. So the presentation that we'll be giving today is more on um, how we started as well as the foundation and some of the ins and outs of our cooperative and how we run it here on um, the Zuni reservation since we are uh, from a reservation we have several different things that we have to consider and we'll talk about that more in the presentation but you can go to the next slide. So the creation of um, art or Ancestral Rich Treasures of Zuni was a runoff from a previous organization known as Zuni Pueblo Art Walk. This organization was set up to give um, a lot of the tourism, but also the buyers that come to Zuni more of an in-depth look on artist studios, the creation of these wares, and it was sort of a uh, jumping point for um, what arts sort of um, took from this previous organization and just sort of ran with it. And the reason for um, the arts cooperative to actually be a cooperative is there was a extreme need in our community. We um, are very special in a way that uh, we have a jobber market. So this is where outside individuals come into our reservation and they purchase um, artwork and uh, the, uh, at very, very low prices, um, oftentimes not even wholesale pricing. It is oftentimes quite lower where then they would go and sell it to a gallery or um, in order to make a profit. And we found out 
through a lot of interactions with a lot of other artists that, that there was business education uh, lacking in terms of setting prices and trying to get them to have an adequate amount uh, for their wares that they were creating. But we also found it interesting that there was also a need for cultural education and preservation. Since our community is oral in our traditions and um, in our culture, a lot of the symbolisms and the art forms within our uh, culture itself were sort of being lost and just being replicated because they saw this in uh, previous art forms or were inspired by them but never knew the true meaning. That was one need. Another need is that Zuni even though we do have trading posts here and other businesses, only about less than three to four are actually owned by members of the community themselves. A lot of the other training posts that are here are owned by outside individuals and uh, we kind of really don't get a say in the pricing of our artwork or its uh, validation or uh, things of that nature. But for us as an arts cooperative, we were incorporated on April 23rd, um, 2019 with the state of New Mexico. And this was a, uh, a quite a process in itself from creating the board to creating bylaws and then getting the incorporation status put in. And it kind of goes um, in a tricky situation where even though we are cooperate incorporated with the state of New Mexico, uh, we just have to report on the um, uh, progress of the cooperative in terms of the revenue that's being generated. And um, since we are um, sort of on a, well, not sort of, we are on the reservation. There are different uh, protocols that we have to go by, but we can go on to the next slide. Uh, just to give some more background or some context to where we're from. Uh, Zuni Pueblo is part of the 19 Pueblos here. It's just another term for uh, how we're structured socially and pretty much we're, uh, traditionally we live in Pueblos and that's pretty much how we're um, categorized, I suppose you could say. But we're also part of the 22 Pueblos in. 21? 19. No, 21 pueblos. No, 21 tribes. Sorry. 21 tribes in total in New Mexico. So we're actually the biggest or the largest pueblo out of the 19, but we're also the poorest. Uh, that obviously concludes or goes to the fact that we don't have a lot of jobs here. Um, and also part of that, a unique part of our pueblo is we have a large artist, artist community here. It, there's a lot of artists here. If you toss out a, a pebble, you'll hit an artist, you'll hit another artist, and you'll hit another artist, and you'll hit a wife and artist, so, you know, and it'll just kind of go on and art on and on. So you'll <laughs> it's more uncommon to have uh, a person who is not artistically inclined, who doesn't have any sort of art background. That's more uncommon. Actually, it's pretty much one, one in 10, maybe, if I were to go that far. But yeah, um, we just started this co-op just to, but just the issue of trying to get our people on a fair market so we could all stand shoulder to shoulder, whether you're traveling art to art shows, going abroad, traveling the whole country, going to art shows, or if you're just staying home. We want a fair market for everybody. So whether you, whether or not you're a big name or not, we want a fair market for everyone. That's one of the bigger things that we wanted to accomplish with that co-op. I'll, I'll already take it away now. So with the cooperative by itself, we noticed that there was a need for actual space to sell our wares, but also for trading and other things of that nature. So during the time of our start, which was uh, early 2019, uh, midway towards July, we actually acquired this um, historic building that is right on uh, Main Street here in Zuni. Um, originally, this was a um, post office, then went to a trading post, and now we took it over. So we are very fortunate to have the building completely furnished with uh, display cases and things of that nature. Um, 
so we are have we do have a physical location here. Um, we've roughly been running it for about two years, but due to COVID, um, about one year uh, was completely just online sales. Um, just recently, we've uh, reopened up the gallery to the general public. So that has affected the income. But the income that is shown here is from six months. And that is um, uh, quite remarkable, considering we had no marketing, no advertising. And a lot of the uh, income generated was from our own personal clientele because uh, within our cooperative, we have a lot of well-known artists arranging in various mediums. So uh, we brought in our own clientele to help bring this uh, uh, sort of our seed money. And then from there, um, a lot of interest in the cooperative um, started to roll. But from the gallery website sales from that six months, we managed to make 20,813 and 35 cents. And that's only from that six months. And being open from let's see, Monday to Sunday, no, Tuesday to Sunday, we're closed on Mondays. So that was a, a little fun thing that we managed to accomplish within six months and within uh, that time frame, we managed to pay out our artists uh, $12,237. And this is only from the first six months of being actually open and in business. So um, uh, then the figures have changed. Um, this is just to show the sort of um, accomplishment that we had at the beginning. As far as reporting, we do have to do federal taxes. So we file as a C corporation. Also with uh, New Mexico, we just do the incorporation report. Since we are on the uh, reservation, um, uh, it depends on the state and tribal laws where you do have to file with the state or you, since we're selling on the reservation itself, it, um, may or may not be exempt depending on your tribal uh, laws. And the only thing that we report to the Pueblo of Zuni is our tribal sales taxes of that month and it goes bi-monthly. And we do collect tribal sales tax. And also we have to file every year for a business license to sell on the uh, reservation. So. These are the main things that we, um, in terms of reporting, have to uh, cooperate with. And it may vary from organization to organization, depending on um, whether or not you sell on the reservation or if you have a physical location in a, um, a city in your state. It may vary, some things may change. And since we are art-based, uh, were a little bit different, but then depending on your cooperative and the way it's structured, it may vary. Did you want to add anything? Uh, just to highlight how <laughs> much marketing we had when we had our soft opening. We didn't even have a Facebook page, nothing, absolutely nothing in terms of marketing. And it's just very fortunate that our artists and us as well had a uh, clientele we could tell our cooperative about like hey we're having a cooperative you should come over you should see all this wonderful art and the building itself was wonderful we just had to dust it off and it was ready to go honestly so and we are very fortunate that the building owner is Zuni and she wanted a Zuni organization to be the renters so we actually had some competition too in the beginning we there was a coffee shop uh, a gym that wanted to be like a Zumba, Zumba sort of place. So we had to get our paperwork done really quickly so we could kind of beat them in that paperwork. So it was a mad dash <laughs> and getting incorporated and everything. It should take two years. And from that two years, we should expect another two years to turn a profit. But we got everything done in four months, <laughs> four or five months. And from then, our first year, we didn't really expect much. We were just hoping to keep our doors open, but we are very fortunate and very lucky that we turned a profit that year. So hopefully we can keep the momentum going, even recovering from the pandemic. So. And our case is very special to where 
uh, Zuni is already well known for its fetish carving and silversmith work and pottery. So we already had a interest in the art forms already present and this helped to not only um, boost sales, but it also was a additional attraction to the Pueblo of Zuni for outside individuals to come and see. Okay, I believe we can go to the next slide. So the way we structure our organization is through our board. So our president, uh, who's the one behind the Dell computer, his name is Keith Hidaki. He's a two-dimensional artist. Our vice president is the gentleman with the gray pepper hair. Uh, he's a well-known silversmith. And then we also have our secretary, which is Candace, which is behind, next to me. Uh, we also have our treasurer. Her name is Pamela Lasilu. She's a uh, inlay silversmith. She, her work is very good. And then we have additional board members, um, Jeff Shatima, who is a silversmith and fetish carver, as well as myself, which I am a 2D artist and I work in Pueblo textiles from embroidery to weaving. And then we have an additional board member, Galen Wistica, who does a lot of the traditional Zuni pottery. So our media's range and the skill levels are vast. Um, Carlton Hamon, uh, Keith and Candace and myself, and as well as Jeff Shatima. We've um, dealt a lot with a lot of organizations and uh, creating them, making sure they're upkeep. And as for myself and Candace, we've dealt a lot in the uh, not only the world of academia, but also office work. So we are very familiar with uh, document creations and management and things of that nature that we bring certain things to the table to make the cooperative as a whole run, but it comes down to our member participation to actually keep the, the cooperative thriving. We're just the figureheads and uh, with the cooperative, the structure of it is we, every member gets a vote. So we just um, sort of have to um, uh, sort of a case by case basis in terms of sort of issues that might arise in the cooperative development and the running of the cooperative. But um, in terms of our board, this is how we structured it. It's very um, streamlined. And uh, uh, the way we run our organization is currently through Robert's rules. So it's quite boring, but I forced everybody to learn Robert's rules <laughs> and trained everyone, hopefully adequate enough to where Robert's rules are understandable. Uh, like most things, it always takes practice. So. That's how the board part is um, structured. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, um, just to give my little tidbit. Um, if anyone's worked with artists, if you're an artist yourself, uh, it's known that the natural enemy to the artist is paperwork. So we take on that boring paperwork and we shovel it along <laughs> to the best of our ability so our artists don't have to deal with such things or very minimal, if not work. So we're just pretty much the, the paper pushers and our artists pretty much take, not take on brunt of the work, but they are really the life and blood of our organization. So we just kind of turn the head to where different directions are. So, but mostly do most of the boring paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can go to the next slide. So currently our membership is there 32 individuals in total, um, 12 are female, 21 are male. And this ranges from, I believe our youngest member is in their 20s and our oldest is in their 80s. So we have a very uh, wide range in terms of the generational gap, but also it helps with the uh, camaraderie of the cooperative because originally, a lot of us are show artists or we sell directly to jobbers or we sell directly to training posts. There was really no interaction with one of us. If we were in a particular field, there was always that um, sort of uh, westernized uh, competitions sort of stuck 
element to each one's field. We never really shared secrets. We never really talked about business management, how they might have done something. Maybe they knew an easier way to do something. But through the cooperative, with our membership being at um, quite fairly big, considering um, how many people we managed to lure into the cooperative, we sort of started to uh, lean on one another and create a family within ourselves. And this has um, helped with a lot of the uh, backbone of the cooperative. And in terms of voting, we have a rule, one membership, one vote. We do have a membership where a couple is sharing a singular membership. The only thing with that is um, since they are both on a one membership, uh, application, they get one vote. Um, so that way we get a, a very diplomatic and a, a sort of a, a system in place. And in terms of our documents, uh, we have our bylaws and this um, is the backbone and the uh, way things are to be structured. And the only way that this can be changed is through the annual meeting. Um, in terms of amendments because of the uh, incorporation aspect. The original bylaws that were accepted in the incorporation um, in order for those amendments to be done, it has to be by a majority vote. And in order to have that, then we would have to refile the incorporation uh, documents to ensure that they read uh, the same as our changes that we've made in our actual cooperative themselves. Uh, two other documents that we have in place are our membership agreement and our consignment agreement. And um, the only thing I forgot to add on here was the application process. Um, our application process is fairly simple. We do have a um, streamlined sort of a way that we get um, these documents processed. And um, in terms of what we give our members in, um, in tax forms is a 1099 or a non-employment tax form. The only stipulation with this form is that the artisan themselves has to sign a W-9 and have that on file along with a minimum of a $500 um, sold within that um, fiscal year or tax season. So that they can use to file for their taxes. And if they don't meet that minimum requirement, and um, I'm not sure if it does vary by state to state or region to region on the minimum amount for the 1099s, but uh, they do have the option of claiming any funds if it doesn't meet that minimum requirement. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just to speak more about the, the sharing of information and techniques, my ass. Um, but with the whole competition and jobbers amongst ourselves, it just created this dynamic of like, I can't teach you what I know because you're, you're competition. I'm making competition by teaching you and I have to put food on my table. So I'm sorry, I can't teach you. Or even if relate, or the person is related to one, they can't teach the other because again, competition. And even less so if you don't, if you're not related, um, just to give context, like me and him are cousins and we're in business. So we, if anyone were to ask us and how we do something or how do you paint this, we'll give the, before the co-op, we would have given you the most vague answer we could possibly come up with to make sure we don't give up the secrets that we do have. Like, how do you make greeting cards? How do you make this and that? We'll just give you the most <laughs> thing that you could possibly um, Google or just like you, you can go on YouTube, just go on YouTube, whatever. We won't give you the exact process to it just because that's, and we're not the only ones like this. Everyone in the village is like that. But while in the cooperative, an unintended benefit was we were just to use our, ourselves as, as an example, we were working on something at the co-op and some of our members walked by like, why are you doing it like that? There's a faster and easier way to do that. Um, We'll show you, come on over, we'll show you. You can use our materials, you can use our tools just to, so you can get the feel of the process. 
and we tried it and we looked at each other like, why are we so dumb? Why are we using this, this really slow, expensive process? Like, yeah, and then they just showed us all this stuff and they showed us where to buy the materials, where, what we could do. And that was, that was amazing. That was really cool to see. And we're more, in turn, we're more uh, accepting on teaching others and what we know and just pretty much reset, like keep going with that cycle of like, let me teach you, use my tools, use my materials until you can get the hang of it. That was a really cool uh, benefit of the, the co-op that no one really thought of, but really kind of took into account of when we first started. But it's, yeah, we've really created this family in the co-op. So it's been pretty cool. I think we're done with that side. <laughs> So the only main requirement that we have as an organization is that they have to be a, a road member in our uh, Pueblo. And uh, we check for CIBs to make sure that um, they are a uh, enrolled member. And then in terms of um, a cooperative, um, technically a cooperative does not have any paid employees, but um, uh, what we do is um, require volunteer requirement or otherwise known as sweat equity. So for each individual member, uh, it's um, two four hour shifts per cycle. And per cycle, when we say per cycle, it is the total membership. Um, once they've all picked their days, that kind of is considered one cycle. Now we're very, um, uh, different, as I said before, in our age range, that um, some of our older uh, individuals or some that might um, not be physically able to volunteer, they can designate somebody to volunteer on their behalf. Um, we're uh, always needing the input, but also the manpower of our um, individual members to volunteer. And the volunteering aspect is uh, manning the gallery, uh, making sure they greet customers, um, take sales, or even just general cleanup. Sometimes we have members that are afraid of uh, uh, technology and don't want to use the POS system. So they just come and clean and talk. And it just helps build that um, bonding aspect to uh, create that interaction. And uh, we've noticed that a lot of the, uh, from the volunteers, that their education on art forms has expanded because a lot of times based on um, their field, they either have heirloom designs or uh, traditional teachings taught by a specific individual that were predominantly just kept to themselves. But when we interact with one another, we're learning from one another uh, these, um, a lot of the sacred imagery or design techniques or uh, things of that nature is always the constant um, learning environment. And we don't also um, just teach amongst each other, we teach our, um, a clientele that come in because what we're trying to offer is a authentic uh, product and what's more authentic than buying directly from the artisans themselves. That is our key selling point in our cooperative is that you're buying authentic wares and buying them directly from the artist. You get the stories, you get the methods, you get um, various aspects that you won't get at a trading post where they're selling a pretty piece of jewelry and they just have the artist's name but they don't know the symbolism the meaning or anything else behind it you're getting that one-on-one -on -one experience and that's what we found to really help boost the not only the selling aspect but the pop popularity of the cooperative itself is that one-on-one -on -one reaction and in terms of sales we do have a consignment fee at the moment and this is just to pay for our general overhead, the building rent, insurance, uh, the key security system, water, lights, and uh, things of that nature. So for the general membership, it's a 60-40. Arts gets 60, the membership gets 40. Oh, that's flipped around. Whoops. <laughs> I saw that uh, I messed up right there, but it's flipped. <laughs> Sorry for that one. 
And then again, uh, the gallery manager, I think I flipped that one too. So <laughs> the uh, membership, uh, the managers that are um, supervisors over the volunteers, uh, they get uh, 75, the arts gets 25. Sorry, I, I kind of messed up on that part right there. I didn't see that. But the way we run our consignment is based on these um, percentages. And uh, the reason why the gallery managers get a higher percentage is because they have to do a lot more work in terms of the supervision of the volunteers, the entering of inventory, uh, restocking as well as management of the website in stock, gallery in stock, making sure they read front to back because we don't want to sell something online that might not be in the gallery. And um, that kind of it's a little bit of hassle, especially if it's a one of a kind piece. And in terms of our general membership, this is just based on uh, their volunteer hours. And um, did you have anything to add? Uh, just to touch on authenticity real quick, another goal of the co-op was to ensure authenticity because back in the heyday when um, the art market was really high in demand, it was so high that none of the artists here, even though we're a majority artists, or we have a big artist community here, we couldn't meet the demand of what, what outsiders wanted us to do. So to meet that demand, they made these villages or these little cities in, over abroad in China and the Philippines and they named these little villages Zuni. And they made they trained all these village people to create our artwork, like our sculptures, our carvings, our fetishes, our everything that we made, they pretty much made and faster with uh, materials that weren't authentic, uh, like man-made materials. So when they have the little um, artist stamp in the back or on the bottom of the piece, whatever it is, they would say made in Zuni and at very small, China or Philippines. So it's actually made in Zuni, but it's not made in Zuni here. So that took away the dollar from here even more. And of course, we're disadvantaged economically speaking. So that took a hit on our market. And unfortunately, if you don't know much about Zuni art and you really want to get into it, there are certain people that have come by like, this is an heirloom piece. How much is this for? And it's fake. So that's to prove that's to protect our artists and our customers as well so that we can educate our customers to know what's really authentic and just to protect our artists and to make sure their bills are paid and so on and so forth. And then with every piece, we do have an authenticity card that is signed by the artist, as well as a snippet of the 1990 Indian Arts and Crafts Act, uh, stating that it does meet these requirements. And um, uh, since we have various art forms, we have to be educated on the materials and also the do's and the don'ts um, in terms of traditional sort of items like kachina dolls and things of that nature. Due to the Migratory um, Bird Act, um, some of these figures can't have migratory bird feathers because it is illegal to sell. We have to monitor this as well as um, labeling um, pottery. Even though it kind of sounds a little bit weird, um, traditional pottery that we clay body collected in the Pueblo is, um, has to be labeled as that. Whereas if somebody does greenware or slip casted ware, we have to notify our uh, clientele that this is greenware and it's done with ceramic paint. So that way we meet those requirements. So that way there's no in and inauthenticity and we don't kind of combat the Indian Arts and Crafts Act so that we were following guidelines. And this is something that we train our uh, general uh, members as well as our managers a little bit more in depth on what can be taken in terms of inventory and what meets standards uh, in terms of the authenticity aspect and uh, meeting the requirements of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So that's um, pretty much our cooperative in a shell. And we do um, have a website. The website is listed below. We do have an email and our phone number is listed. And uh, for those that are a little bit tech savvy, I got a QR code in the corner. Just um, drag your little camera over there and it'll take you directly to our website. And um, I'm pretty sure we have some questions. Hopefully we like answering questions. So bring on your questions. But that's pretty much all of our 
cooperative to an extent. There's a lot more, but uh, we'd be here for hours. <laughs> This is Pamela. I have a couple of questions. You mentioned that, um, did you guys by choice design your cooperative so that it's all volunteer? Or at some point in time, do you ever plan on having a paid manager, uh, paid marketing, those kinds of positions within your cooperative? Um, in terms to, to meet that cooperative uh, requirement, um, there technically shouldn't be no paid employees, but technically I'm the only paid employee. Um, my salary is paid through grants or a lot of times due to um, involvement with the Pueblo of Zuni and also some organizations around here, they are willing to pay for my salary so that way it doesn't directly come from the arts. But currently we are, um, looking into grants and other things like that so we can have an in-staff uh, site coordinator as well as two additional individuals to help sort of um, take care of the back end in terms of documentation as well as the overall um, needs of the cooperative in terms of website management, uh, grant writing, and um, marketing. So those are the aspects that um, um, as Candace said before, paperwork isn't our friend, and sometimes uh, you need a specific individual that loves paperwork, um, like Candace and myself, although we love it, we sometimes hate it. It's something that is necessary to keep the organization moving. So hopefully in the near future, due to grants or uh, donations, we'll build up enough um, funds to where we can have those permanent positions within the gallery itself. But currently, um, in terms of the volunteer aspect, it was um, something that was agreed upon in the initial creation of the cooperative. Do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, that's pretty much how we said, like, we have to, no one's going to help us in doing this. We have to do this ourselves. So we should do it together was the thought behind the volunteer aspect of it. So we wanted to really take control of our own cooperative and make it our own. So that's how we thought of it as adding that extra little bit in there to make sure that our members know that this gallery is theirs as well as everybody else's. So just to put that more bonding aspect, but uh, having paid staff wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that answers your question. I have one more question. Um, the um, during COVID, because your whole community was shut down, but you guys actually made a profit. And can you share about what you did with your auction and how that auction was structured every month? Okay, so um, as stated before, due to COVID, it roughly started um, around January, where we uh, well, actually December. That's when our gallery was closed, closed to the general public. So what we did was uh, we moved every inventory that we had into our website. And then from there, we were um, publicized on our social media, such as Facebook and Instagram, uh, creating stories and things of that nature. So in order to help um, our membership, we started creating auctions. So these auctions were either, originally they started on a monthly basis, and then from there they went to bi-monthly due to a need for uh, more of a time frame for the artisans to actually create these artwork. And also a uh, theme was placed uh, monthly, and this also helped them sort of push them in the direction instead of maybe bringing something that was uh, sometimes, um, it was a mishmash, so it was a little bit more easier to keep it streamlined with a theme. And so what originally happened was um, uh, artisans were given an account of sorts to where they had a specific number of funds available. So they, the um, gallery could purchase directly from the artist, and so that would help a little bit of... Um, keep funds going along with the website sales that we were having and then those items became um, uh, 
under the ownership of the cooperative. And then from there, we would host these monthly sales to have generate revenue, but also it helped generate the publicity to the website, which also kind of worked hand in hand in trying to uh, get as much clientele, as much outreach as we could in order to get our memberships uh, items sold. Because uh, during this time, uh, funds were very limited um, due to the uh, nature of COVID and uh, travel restrictions. Um, sometimes um, they would go out and sell their wares or not even the trading posts were open, which was their normal uh, venues because all of the art shows and markets that they, that they were normally going to were completely uh, canceled in person. So a lot of it was done, uh, some of them did um, online uh, markets and things of that nature. Uh, it was hit or miss a lot of times because um, due to some of the communities um, not having access to a lot of bandwidth or uh, access to Wi-Fi, they were unable to interact with the clientele via the online aspect of those markets. So we really wanted to create a way to have our membership um, still generate funds. And this is where the market um, online sales kind of came into play in helping with not only the sale of their item, but the publicity of the website and our organization as a whole to help generate uh, funds that they can um, utilize. But it is, um, since it is the art market, it is hit or miss. Sometimes they we have an auction where everything sells. Sometimes we have uh, runoffs of um, unsold items and those will go directly to the website. And um, we have different things in place. Um, currently, we're restructuring the auctions to where they bring in their any item because um, originally there was a limit to how much we could purchase from the artist. So this one is directly the funds are going to them with the same consignment rate of the 6040. So they can bring in any item they want and then from there, any number of items as well. And then we'll have our auction and see if they sell. And they do have the option of taking it back with them and trying to sell it or putting it directly into the gallery inventory. So that's a new program, not new program, but it's a new type of the uh, structure to this auction that we're going to start to experiment with. So that way artists can get more funds than the initial uh, auction funds that were available to them. Yeah, so how the auctions were born was how do we take care of our artists and how do we keep them afloat financially? So that was one of the things that we came up as an initiative. Another initiative was a face mask um, competition. So we would have our members make up a design for a face mask and we would print it. And whatever face mask that sells, however many they get, they get a check at the end of the month with depending how much they sell with a percentage going to the co-op and a percentage going to the artists. So you're really trying to come up with ways to help our artists keep afloat financially. So and it was very fortunate that we had a donor that donated a sizable amount to where we could give back to our artists as well as the community at the same time. So we were very fortunate. Just go ahead and unmute if you have a question. We're pretty relaxed. Hello, this is Sharon. Um, I was wondering, how did you, or maybe you went through a couple different ways of signing up the volunteers for your hours of work, your shifts. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit of what you went through to get the artist to sign up and what works well now? Um, well, for that, I had to create a structure. So the way that um, I kind of set it up is to where, uh, for each individual day, we have a morning and an afternoon shift. For each individual shift, there has to be a manager on staff, so that way that they can monitor. And oftentimes, the site coordinator will be on staff as well to help troubleshoot whatever the general manager is unable to um, uh, get done. And then from there, we have our volunteers. Um, originally, it was... Um, 
two volunteers, but now it's only uh, one volunteer per shift. So that way we can, uh, due to the COVID, take those precautions into uh, consideration to limit as much uh, people in the actual gallery. And um, again, with the COVID, we have our sanitation protocols and uh, temperature checks and to make sure that everybody's safe and um, at the moment, we're only requiring those that are vaccinated to um, actually volunteer. So those that are unvaccinated are exempt from the volunteer aspect. And so the way we did this originally was by calling everybody uh, one by one. And this was um, tricky at times because of individual schedule uh, ranges and um, uh, Later on, we found that it was a little bit cumbersome to call everybody one by one to fill in the individual days. So we kind of all had a meeting and um, as the cooperative as a whole and decided to do a lottery type system. So everybody's name is put into a, like Jeopardy, a wheel, and we go shift by shift by shift and then uh, basically put people into the lotted spots. Um, the only time we do offer exemptions is on um, family emergencies and things of that nature or religious obligations. Um, they're allowed to uh, find a replacement if they are unable to uh, volunteer during those times. So we're lenient to an extent that um, some things are um, I guess in terms of acts of God, they're uh, exempt from the volunteering aspect. But originally that's how we would get our memberships to volunteer. And then from there, we would have to train our managerial staff to um, on the protocols in terms of POS, uh, opening the gallery and closing it, setting the alarm system, making sure the volunteers um, follow the sanitation as well as the general cleanup of the gallery to maintain it. And then from there, we, we train our general membership on a um, sort of watered down version of all of the things we train the general membership, or general managers. Nice. So did you have, um, did you allow them to switch out shifts let's say oh something came up can you take my shift and i'll switch out with you do you allow something like that uh correct uh we created a form to where there is a uh a replacement volunteer replacement form so they just have to fill it out with the contact of the individual that will be doing the replacing so once they've been approved and uh, with the time of COVID, we have to make sure that they have their vaccination cards fully filled out. And um, once they're uh, able to volunteer, let's say they can't fill their shift, their replacement can come in for them. Or another option is if two of the members in our cooperative, let's say one's working Monday, the other one's working Sunday, and if they want to switch with each other, we can allow that as well. So we're kind of lenient on the uh, switching aspect, but in terms of volunteering, everybody has to volunteer, um, whether in person or with a replacement or somebody to sub for them. Okay. One other question I had for you is the age of your members. Do mm -hmm. you allow youth to become members also? Uh, yes, that's currently in next project is trying to create a youth organization within our organization, because a lot of times we'll find that the uh, youth members in our uh, community are artistically inclined, but a lot of times they have no sort of um, background in terms of a lot of the art forms and their history. So what we want to do is be that backbone for our younger generation in terms of uh, cultural significance and um, techniques and things of that nature. So that's one thing that we're going to start focusing on is bringing in the youth and making sure that they're aware of our uh, cultural history as well as the significance of certain pieces. Since we are a artist cooperative, all of our art forms have um, in one way or another connections to our culture 
and our um, mindset and ideologies of us as Zuni uh, individuals. Yeah, and those of our membership who are elderly and cannot physically volunteer, they can choose a person of their family or person who wants to volunteer for them and they will volunteer their shift for them. Yeah, our organization. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, all right. Oh, no problem. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, but our organization, we're not um, ages or we're not. Um, uh, Uh, we're open to everybody, whether or not they are ranging in age or disability or um, things of that nature. Our community is very open as well as our foundations in our own culture relate very well with the cooperative model in terms of cooperation and um, assisting of one another and acceptance of one another. And it kind of, kind of was second nature when we started the cooperative that these went hand in hand and we, it was easy for us to understand and move as a cooperative and uh, carry one another. Yeah, it's very fortunate that the cooperative development organization, um, Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico, was very understanding. They weren't inflexible that we had to go by a certain timeline, a certain uh, process for it. They let us do what we wanted to do because we felt that was right. So they were very flexible in letting us do what we needed to do. A couple other questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. On the consignment, did you come across where artists need the money now? They don't want to wait. You know, have, did you have um, opportunity to buy some, but still have some on consignment? How did you work through that? Um, currently, at the moment, um, the only way that we were able to buy was through the auctions. But hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to create a fund where we can buy directly. Um, that was another need, and that is um, a mild deterrent of getting new membership because of the consignment aspect. Uh, we pay our artisans bi-weekly, um, and that kind of is um, different for these uh, our artists in our community because they're used to the jobber system or the selling directly to the trading post where they get money right then and there. It's kind of the waiting game when you're uh, a part of the cooperative where you place your items in the gallery and hope that they sell within those two weeks to get a check. So those are the concerns that our general membership um, have and we're trying to find ways to where either through grants or creating a fund or a generalized program to help alleviate this aspect. So, because uh, um, within our community, we have a lot of religious obligations as well as um, a need for um, uh, at that moment funds. And we're gonna try and see what as a whole we can do to help one another in um, these times. <laughs> see if we can buy directly from our artisans and it'll probably start with our artisans first and then to the generalized community. So hopefully uh, we get to that point within our, um, in our, in our years uh, that we're gonna be in business, hopefully that we get to give back and help our members a lot more than what we're doing now. And then the other question is on quality. I know it's hard to judge an artist on their quality. Um, how do you handle that? Do you have a committee or, you know, how do you look at that? So the way we do that is with our managers and the managers that we have on staff are uh, ranging in their particular fields from uh, the minimum at five to maybe 10, 20 years in one particular field. Um, Carlton Hamon has been a silversmith for decades and uh, two-dimensional artists, we know what to look for. And in terms of textile artists, we know what to look for. So we train each other and this is where uh, the managerial staff um, 
we have to cooperate with one another in terms of um, accepting inventory because they're the only ones allowed to accept inventory and help set the prices. And so this is all based off of quality that we've sort of um, in our years of experience understand. And if items do not meet quality, we'll gently um, explain ways of helping and uh, fixing the problem and offer them a chance to bring it back. So that way we're ensuring that not only our clientele get the best product they can, but also their work that itself can progress and it can flourish because of the uh, uh, sort of um, the community system we have now with our managerial staff is we're wanting to help our cooperative members give the best quality product they can and also teach them the methods and um, that's kind of going into our future plans of um, purchasing more equipment that they can do on the site um, sort of fabrications and silversmithing and other types of art forms great thank you so much yeah no problem we actually just purchased some uh, equipment for silversmithing and uh, yeah. and carving as well. So hopefully that the artists that we do have in our membership who don't have a studio, there is a good portion that don't have a studio and they just put all their equipment outside and they work no matter what weather, whether it's snowing or if it's 100 degrees outside, they'll be outside working. And we wanna provide a good space for them where they can uh, work well that work well for their art. So we're hoping to get that done sometime this year. So. But we did purchase the equipment, so hopefully we can get the housing for that done. So hopefully this time next year we can report on that. Yeah. <laughs> we want to thank you so much for your presentation and for taking time uh, to be with us tonight. And it, it's so appreciative, you know, just to learn about how you guys have set things up and how you're working in your community and the strengths and those unintended impacts that have happened in your community about people sharing again and working together and, you know, breaking down that uh, competitiveness that had been, you know, established by the jobber market. So you guys have beautiful work. I've seen it. And it's, uh, it's amazing the quality of work that they carry there. And both Candace and Elroy are amazing artists in their own right and do beautiful work. Elroy, do you do the skateboards? Uh, correct. Uh, both okay. Candace and I do the um, uh, skate decks that have um, uh, painted imagery on them. And they're all hand painted as well as um, textile work. We both do embroidery, weaving, uh, things of that nature. Yeah, so we grew up together as pretty much siblings. Our brothers and sisters are a lot older than we are. And our nieces and nephews are a lot younger than we are. So we're kind of that awkward generation. <laughs> So we're cousins and so we just kind of grew up together and in age we're only a month apart. So we went to school together and whatever one was into a club, we would pull that person into it. Like, I don't want to, like, that's too bad. I gave your name, <laughs> show up tomorrow. <laughs> that's how we got into the co-op. He was, he got into the co-op uh, through his brother-in-law, my cousin-in-law. And he pulled me into it, like, just come by tomorrow. Like, I don't want to. <laughs> like, well, that's too bad, because I told him you would come. Like, ah, crap. <laughs> Fine. So and that's how I got into the co-op. And same thing with the skateboards. That's how it all started. Uh, there was an exhibit that was just for Native um, artists who paint on skateboard decks. And I was a little skeptical, like, why not? Uh, well, why, why don't we try it? Why don't, why don't we try this out? And when I first mentioned to like, nah, I don't want to do that. Why would I do that? <laughs> like someone's going to skate on it. Why would I like paint on that? Like, well, that's too bad. I gave your name. <laughs> we need to get our boards in by X date. So and that's how that all started. So it's amazing how that took off. Well, we wish you guys so much success. And um, we hope that we can have you again to have conversations as we start growing these art cooperatives. Um, you know, throughout our communities, and there's so much new exciting things that are emerging. Um, we plan on hosting Kuala Arts and Crafts. They're the oldest Native uh, arts cooperative in the U.S. They're celebrating their 75th year, and we will we'll be announcing the date of, of theirs and also uh, Arctic Co-op 
will be presenting uh, on their retail and wholesale markets that they do with their citizens. And in um, September, we have, uh, we'll be finishing up with a group of ag cooperatives and programs. And so we will have the Among the Corn Stocks Cooperative. Uh, it's a native uh, ancestral corn cooperative at Oneida Nation they'll be presenting. We'll have Fond du Lac uh, Farming uh, program presenting on their program. And then we're also gonna have Soul Fire Farm. And uh, they, they're doing some really exciting things and they've created a very interesting model that is the cooperative and a nonprofit that operate together. And the nonprofit is a member of the cooperative. And then we will be uh, finishing up with the uh, San Javier Farm Cooperative from Tohono O'odham at the end of September. So if you go back to uh, Center for Rural Affairs, you can register for those. And we'll have those up pretty soon. Uh, we're just finishing up some final details for those ag co-ops and uh, some really great presentations. And you guys, um, we just are so grateful that you made the time to be here with us tonight. And um, we wish you just prosperity and you know good health and um, for your community, especially now that you've reopened and that you guys continue to stay healthy there. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. It was fun to do this. So if you're ever in Zuni, come by. <laughs> And make sure to check out our website and all of our social media. We're, we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> They've got some beautiful pieces. So, yes, thank you so much. You guys have a beautiful evening and thank you for the people that attended. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And yep, thanks. Thanks for everyone who attended. Take care. Good night. Good night.